Okay, I'm gonna launch us on Facebook. So aloha as everybody is joining us. We're just gonna take a moment to get um, allow people to join us as well as to also this is being shared on the Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook. Hello everybody, mahalo for joining us. We're going live on Facebook, on our Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook. Seeing some familiar names in our attendees list. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> All right, so I think some more people are gonna start coming in, but let's just get started. So we're on time. Um, Aloha mai kako. My name is Serena Fukushima. I'm the Public Relations and Education Specialist for the Maui Invasive Species Committee. I'm here with Beth Speak, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, also a community liaison for the Community Cookie Control Program at MIST. And I'm here with Susan, who is our coordinator for the Community Cookie Control Program, as well as our acting cookie control coordinator. Um, just some housekeeping while we get started. Um, this is a webinar, so we won't be able to see your faces. Um, or have your mics activated. And so if you want to have, um, have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat on the lower part of your screen. There's also a question and answer um, button that you can submit questions in. And Beth and I will be monitoring that as the presentation goes. Um, we'll let Susan um, do her presentation and then we'll answer questions at the end. And Beth is going to launch a poll. Oh, but before that too, we're also recording on Zoom and we're streaming live on Facebook. At the end of the month, you'll be able to access this recording on the Hawaii Invasive Species Council YouTube page as well as MISCs. And if you wanna see it right away after it's done and share it, you can go on the MISC Facebook to do that. And so Beth launched the poll. So if you have a chance, please um, click in your answers. This helps us understand who's joining us and for planning future high SAM events. And you can't, all of you guys joining on Facebook, you cannot see this, but we're just gonna leave um, this poll up for another 30 seconds or so. And we really appreciate all of the folks that are joining us in the webinar for sharing this information. It looks like we have um, people that are joining us from all over the state, which is exciting and from a lot of different kinds of backgrounds. So thank you for sharing that information with us. So like I said, I'm gonna leave this going for another 15 seconds and then I'll share the information with you for a moment too. Yeah, mahalo, we have Maui, Molokai, O'ahu, Kauai, awesome. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna end it Been up for a minute, but we so appreciate you sharing that information. And if you want to look, got folks from all over, from all different kinds of backgrounds, and that heard about this from a bunch of different ways. So thank you very much. Great, mahalo. All right, so I'd like to now introduce our speaker for today. Susan Frett is the Community Koki Control Coordinator and Acting Koki Control Coordinator at Maui Invasive Species Committee, where she has worked since March of 2020. When she's not focused on all things Koki, you can find her walking her dog, cooking, scuba diving, or relaxing in a hammock with a book. That sounds really awesome right now, Susan. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan to get started. Mahalo everyone. All right, thanks Serena and Beth for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen here. Thanks for the opportunity to provide an update about Koki frog control efforts on Maui. This presentation is mainly going to focus on what's new in the last year. Um, for some more detailed information on how and why we control Koki frogs, please check out our presentations from the 2021 Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, Abe Bance gave an in-depth talk last year um, for HiSAM about the history of Koki control efforts on Maui, how we control the frogs and why. 
And that is posted on our MISC YouTube channel that you can find from our webpage, MauiInvasive.org. And additionally, last year, I gave a talk that focused on our community cookie control program at MISC and how community participants can get involved. And this one is available through the HISC YouTube channel. And both are super informative talks and totally relevant now. Um, but I feel like a lot has happened in the last year, so I'm going to focus mainly on 2021. So this is the big picture of Koki on Maui, historically through the present. A population of frogs um, is considered a contiguous area that has five or more calling males. And this map is showing the Koki populations on Maui as of November 19th of 2021, with the green dots being the ones that have been eradicated, yellow have a low number of frogs, orange have a medium level of frogs, and red is high. And there have been a total of 34 populations, 22 of which have been eradicated, two are in monitoring protocol, and 10 remain in active treatment. Um, this is a list of our current populations. Three were discovered in 2021, two were found based on community reports to MISC, and one by a MISC staff person driving in the area and hearing Koki where there hadn't been any before. Uh, one of these new populations was almost immediately quieted by the crew and moved to monitoring protocol. The other two are still in treatment protocol. And also in 2021, an additional population was moved to monitoring protocol. And once the population moves to that status, a MISC staff person will visit the property um, or the location, if it's more than one property with frogs, to do a listening survey at least once every six weeks for a year. If at any time in that year, Koki are heard during that survey by MISC or reported by residents, the population will re-enter treatment protocol. If no frogs have been heard for a year, then they, be, they can be considered eradicated. So Koki are very easily moved by vehicles, equipments, plants, and other items. So it's very important to immediately re report to MISC if you hear a Koki where you haven't heard them before. So we prioritize responding to Koki in new areas to stop them from spreading to other parts of the island. This picture is showing a clutch of Koki frog eggs that have been laid in a bromeliad plant. And those bromeliads are a favorite of Koki frogs because they collect water in them. Um, and sometimes when our crew is spraying them, like you can see the Koki frogs kind of jumping out like popcorn popping out of the plant. Another significant pathway of Koki frogs is through newly installed plants, either ones that have been purchased from a nursery, planted by a landscaper, or from trading with friends, family, or plant groups such as on Facebook or other, other areas, um, which is super great to get new plants. But what we re recommend is for residents, they, they can minimize this pathway by isolating and inspecting any new materials coming onto their property. Um, if Koki are present, you'll likely hear them while they're in isolation and be able to eradicate from plants before putting them out in your yard where they could potentially spread. And all you need to do if you do hear some Koki in some new plants is just give us a call or send us an email um, and I'll have my contact information at the end and we can give you some advice on how to take care of it or come out and give you some help with that. Um, additionally, we have a Koki free nursery program that MISC facilitates, and these nurseries follow some extra precautions to prevent the spread of Koki. And there is an up to date list of these nurseries on our webpage at this address on the slide. The Koki also love to catch a ride on a car, which you might think is kind of unusual, but we think it's because the, the, the males, they'll crawl up into the wheel well and they can hear their call echoing louder in that wheel well. So they really like that. They're trying to project their voices. So if you park your car somewhere with thick vegetation like this in the photo where Koki are present, you'll likely get a Koki on your car and take it home with you. And then finally, if someone with Koki on their property dumps green waste in a Koki free area, it's very likely that frogs will be introduced. So dumping green waste along a roadside like this or anywhere else is a very bad idea. We recommend taking green waste to the green waste facility from Maui County out by the landfill. So this map shows locations of those outlying Koki frogs, meaning they're not located in the main population areas um, or Malika Gulch, which is our largest infestation. They've hitchhiked all over Maui just in 2021 are the ones on this map. And they're hitchhiking by the means that I just mentioned. The green triangles are Koki that have been controlled by members of the public that were reported to us. 
and the blue pentagons are those controlled by MISC. Without this effort uh, last year and many preceding years, uh, Koki would be across Maui by this time. Instead, there are many areas of Maui where residents and visitors don't even know that Koki exists on Maui. Um, early detection and rapid response are key components of MISC's efforts for Koki frogs and other invasive species. Um, our Koki crew currently consists of five and one third full time equivalent staff, and they focus on the gulches and wildland areas as much as possible. Megan Archibald is the crew leader, and Tyler Gagnon is our operations assistant. He splits his time between working on our fleet and equipment and helping the crew in the field. And we have Kayani Singh is a level two field associate working on both the Koki and LFA projects. And Daniel Higashi is our newest level two associate. And then the rest of the crew includes three field associate one positions. Savannah Valdez has been with the project more than one year and Seth Beard and Nick Yashiro joined the crew as permanent hires in December. The crew works during the afternoon until 10 or 11 at night, depending on the time of year. They work on everything from mixing up thousands of gallons of 14% citric acid solution, clearing habitat to better reach the Koki, installing infrastructure such as pipelines to carry the citric to the Koki, and hand capturing and spraying Koki frogs Monday through Thursday all year long. They're an extremely hardworking and dedicated group, and they have a fun time doing it too. Uh, very soon, we're going to be recruiting a few more temporary field crew members. So please check our social media or our webpage for more information on that. Um, and as I said earlier, currently we have five and a third full-time staff. Um, throughout 2021, that number has varied between 5.8 and nine with an average of seven. So even though they're a, full, they're a small time crew, they're tackling a big challenge and they are rock stars who work hard and have made enormous advancements in controlling Koki on Maui. Four of the 10 populations currently in treatment protocol are close to moving into monitoring protocol because of their efforts over the last year. This map is showing efforts by Miss Koki staff in quarter one of 2021. Mainly the work was focused in the Haiku and upcountry areas with a small amount of effort on a population in Wailuku. Similar efforts in 2021, quarter two. Uh, quarter three, if you look closely, you can see that there were a few outlier frogs that had to be treated in the Kihei area. And then um, back in quarter four, again, we're focusing mainly in haiku and upcountry areas. I'm going to zoom in to those haiku and upcountry areas where the crew usually focuses. Um, the red lines here are spray tracks yellow are survey tracks, blue are habitat tracks, and white is showing where pipelines have been installed. So this map is showing quarter one, and then we have the quarter two, um, quarter three, and quarter four. Typically the work is focused around Haiku, but occasionally in Makawao, Pukulani, as well as um, Haile Miley. Um, and in 2021, the crew mainly focused on um, a population near Five Corners and um, some work out at uh, Peahi and then also in um, Kawikoa Gulch east of Giggle Hill. That was their main areas, but they also worked in other areas as well. So we also have our community Koki control program currently with one and a half staff working out in the field with members of the community. Elizabeth Spieth splits her time between working at NISC and as the 643pest.org pest report facilitator. Carl Schwartz joined the team in November of 2020. These two facilitate the work of our community participants who spray Koki in their own backyards and work with their neighbors to control Koki with equipment and supplies, including free citric acid provided by MISC. The community team are the main responders to those outlying Koki frogs and have been managing the field work for our acoustic monitoring program, which I'll get more into later in this presentation. Anyone can participate in the community Koki control program from individual properties up to entire neighborhoods. Uh, we just ask the residents participate as much as they're able. Currently, we have Koki control neighborhoods established in Haiku Hill, Haiku Mauka, Haiku Makai, Lower Kakomo, and Cannery Mauka. Um, some of the equipment and opportunities that are available to participants. If you have access to a truck, you can check out one of our 100 or 55 gallon sprayers for a night or longer. Uh, we like to put these signs up ahead of a community spray week 
to remind the residents of the neighborhood to check their email or the schedule to get signed up and also for other people to call and find out more about what's going on. For neighborhoods who do Koki Spray Weeks, we typically offer free green waste bins periodically. Disposing of green waste properly is a key component of invasive species management. Invasive species such as Koki frogs are easily spread by illegal green waste dumping. And additionally, green waste piles and gulches provide excellent habitat for Koki frogs and are very difficult and dangerous for our crews to address. Um, we also like to stage large amounts of premixed 14% citric acid solution in our Koki control neighborhoods. And these are also staged out in areas where our crew works a lot. Um, and this makes for convenient refills of sprayers by the crew or by participants. A reservoir like this one holds a thousand gallons. Um, and we have a couple um, larger ones too, up to 4,000 gallons. One of our community staff are usually available if needed to assist with spraying and always offer free training on all aspects of Koki control from landscaping advice to how to run the equipment and spray or hand capture Koki frogs and then how to clean up the equipment. For people who don't have a truck or may only have a small amount of area to treat, we have a few of these nine gallon sprayers that are available to loan out. Um, a few photos here of our most active community participants Anyone can do this work. Thinning out overgrown vegetation, hand capturing or spraying frogs isn't difficult, um, especially in people's backyards, but it does require consistent effort over time. And the more people can focus in the backyards, um, the more the crew can go out into the gulches and wildland areas where it is more challenging to get after the koki frogs. And those frogs reproduce very quickly, which is why they're such a threat. It's important to interrupt their reproductive cycle to really work toward eradicating them from your property and then defend the silence. Spraying is usually done at night, but can be done during the day if our crew or community participants know where to find the koki. And citric acid solution is relatively safe to work around. Um, it's at a 14% concentration. So it, it is a skin and eye irritant. So wearing gloves and eye protection is recommended. We also supply some fresh water to our participants so they can rinse the citric off if they happen to spill some. Two of our neighborhoods currently have their own citric acid pipelines installed. The community members check out fire hoses and spray nozzles, as well as pumps from MISC and treat the gulches in their neighborhoods on a recurring basis every six weeks. Haiku Hill was our first neighborhood to start the community program beginning in March of 2019. They canceled two spray weeks over the summer because there were no koki calling within the neighborhood. Since the beginning of the program in Haiku Hill, they have sprayed approximately 69,000 gallons of 12 to 14% citric acid solution and contributed at least 514 hours of active spraying time. These metrics are used as a measure of success since it isn't possible to count the total number of koki controlled. The success in Haiku Hill shows that this program does work but it requires a high participation rate during each spray week and a motivated leader from the community. This year, MISC also began releasing a quarterly Koki specific newsletter called the Koki News Pipeline. Through this newsletter, we share updates from the field crew and the community program, calls to action for Koki control, exciting updates on efforts from around the community and more. If you'd like to sign up for this newsletter, please visit our webpage, maoiinvasive.org, scroll to the bottom and fill out the form to sign up. Our update for the fourth quarter of 2021 is planned to be released this coming Thursday. Starting in late 2020, MISC began working with conservation metrics on a Koki acoustic monitoring program. Currently, we have 20 song meter minis, like this one shown here, out around the Haiku area on private property. Conservation metrics use the first six months of this data to develop an algorithm that can recognize Koki calls. After developing that algorithm, they also began analyzing the signal to noise rate.
Okay, looks like we might have some technical difficulties if we could just hold on for a couple minutes. This is life on Zoom. <laughs> we are going to try to get this um, rolling again. So mahalo for your patience. Just to remind everybody, please um, at, enter any questions you have in the Q&A or chat boxes, because I'm sure that Susan would love to um, talk more about anything she's mentioned in her talk or, hey, Susan, you're back. You're, you're muted, just so you know. <laughs> but yeah, feel free to please put, um, ah, exactly. Thank you for anonymous attendee. And we, and after Susan gets her presentation going back live, um, it'll be just a couple of moments and we'll address these questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, Susan, I see your presentation. Okay, let's back up. Maybe somebody can tell me what looks familiar. You were next slide, uh, go to forward to the second sound meters. One more, that one. This one? Okay. Sorry, now my phone's ringing. Okay. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, okay, so this map, um, I was saying that uh, CMI developed that algorithm to uh, recognize cookie calls. And then they also analyze the signal to noise ratio, which is basically understood as the loudness of the cookie calls at each location. And this map is showing um, the song meter locations in November of this year with the size of the dot representing the calls per minute and the color representing the signal to noise ratio with purple being low and yellow being high. Okay, this chart is indicating Koki activity per night by survey site from February through April of 2021. The third row is from the monitor in Haiku Hill. So this is kind of showing that the Haiku Hill um, spray weeks uh, may be working. Um, because CMI expected um, the results to be higher in Haiku, Haiku Hill because the monitor is located along the edge of Maliko Gulch. So this is an indication that um, the treatments may be working, um, especially when you compare it to this nearby monitor at Umi Falls, which shows a much higher level of Koki calls, and there's no management happening in this area. And here's the most recent example of Koki activity per night by survey site. And this we found really interesting because you can see the seasonality in the Koki calls. They dropped off in most areas during the hot, dry summer months and then came back strongly once the rain started in the fall. In 2022, we plan to continue to work with CMI to deploy additional monitors to fully understand the total Koki population area and density of the Koki within those areas. This will allow us to better strategize our efforts in the future to make the biggest impact with our resources. Um, we have a few new things being planned for 2022 and beyond. The first and most impactful is our Koki barrier. The DLNR secured some CIP funding for this project and asked MISC to facilitate the work. The bid package will be going out to local companies soon to bid on different segments of the project that will be installed in specific areas along Maliko Gulch. The barrier will be three feet tall and comprised of a T post with mesh fabric that the frogs cannot control, crawl over. Um, vegetation will also be cleared on both sides of the barrier using an excavator and masticator as shown in this picture. Um, look for more information on this very soon through our Koki News pipeline um, and likely via a press release. And then additionally, we're looking into the possibility of installing smaller versions of our pipelines to be operated by residents in Koki areas. This will require at least a few neighbors, depending on the size of the property, to work together and with MISC. The pipeline would then allow the residents to control the frogs in their yards and push them further away from their properties. Ideally, something like this would be installed along a gulch edge or other natural property boundary. The pipeline would be connected to a reservoir of premixed citric acid solution that would be supplied and refilled by MISC. Valves could be installed every 50 to 100 feet where participants can attach either a garden hose or a fire hose that can be checked out from MISC. And using these hoses, participants spray their yards and they can spray out um, over like a gulch edge. And that will help them to gain some peace and quiet around their homes. Um, and this is showing one of our Koki crew uh, spraying with a fire hose and nozzle 
from one of our citric acid pipelines. And these pipelines just make it so much easier to get the citric acid to where the cochi are located. And this is just a photo of some of our stockpile of PVC at our base yard at Old Maui High. And with that, I just wanna say thanks for the opportunity to provide this update. My contact information is here. And I wanted to share that we're happy um, that Maui County continues to prioritize our efforts on cochi control and remains our largest funder for that effort. And this is largely due to the widespread positive support that we have from our community here on Maui. So mahalo nui to all of our supporters on Maui. And if you live on island and would like one of these signs for your yard to demonstrate your support, please reach out to me. And I would also like to thank everyone at MISC who works so hard on these efforts and to um, a couple of our community program captains, John Phelps and Harry Tolman and mahalo to Maui County and Hawaii Invasive Species Council and our partners at H3A. And if we have questions, uh, we can take them now. All right, mahalo Susan, that was awesome. Uh, we do have a question in the Zoom Q&A and I'm just looking at Facebook really quick. Um, Facebook Live, the Ha'iku Community Association says, thank you for sharing this with our community. And then in Zoom, we have a question, is citric acid bad for the rest of the environment? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and one that we do get frequently. We have, um, basically we use citric acid because it's relatively benign for the environment and for crews and community participants to work with. Um, so at 14% um, solution, it's not super strong. Um, like if someone spills it on themselves, it might burn a little bit. Um, like if they have a cut that can hurt, but just rinse it off with some water. And then when we're applying, you know, we're applying thousands of gallons to the environment, um, but citric acid has been shown, it doesn't build up in soils and um, we take care to not spray over um, flowing water. That's important. Um, and there's a few, a few species like slugs and snails, those kinds of things can be affected by it. Um, and those are also invasive critters. Um, and harmful to people's gardens and that kind of thing. Um, we do have a great web page um, that goes more into this that I would refer you to, and I can um, try to I find shared that. it in the chat. Oh, great! Thanks, Beth. Um, yeah, yeah I would highly great. recommend that. Yeah, if um, if folks have more questions, I'm happy to take them about about that topic, other stuff too. Uh, um, yeah, we have another question um, from our own Monty Tudor Long. He says, I assume koki eat a lot of insects. Are there studies that show how koki neg affect, I think affect native insects either on Maui or in other places that koki have invaded? Koki do eat a lot of insects. They are just voracious eaters. Um, and they will basically like they'll eat whatever they can they can get um and there are some studies that we have i believe some of them are posted on our web page um that get into this more um it is a concern that um or one of the concerns and why we control kofi frogs is because they're if they're removing a lot of native insects then they're affecting the ecosystem here in maui um and other places where kofi aren't naturally supposed to be so that's one of the reasons why we control them is because they're eating those insects. Um, and also if they, if the koki frogs were to get into the native forest and up where um, our native forest birds live, they would compete with um, any native forest birds that are also trying to eat insects. And you know, most of us have heard that our native forest birds have a lot of challenges already. So we wanna avoid that. All right, and we have another question in the chat from Bill Pereira. Have you investigated using biological controls such as epomies? Epomies? If not, why not? And I had to do a quick Google search, Bill, but it looks like um, this is a genus of ground beetles. Um, I'm epomies, epomies. You can correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. But um, yeah, asking about uh, introducing biological control for koki. Yeah. Um, so that is also a question that we get. 
Um, we do have a relationship with a professor in Florida, uh, Dr. Karen Beard, um, and she is kind of looking at some of those things and trying to advise us about that. Um, so at this time, there's nothing really in the works. Um, we also get a lot of questions about the chytrid fungus um, that's ravaging like native frog populations elsewhere in the world. And um, it's not recommended that we use, try to apply that um, because you just don't know what might happen. Obviously it would have to go through all of the normal um, biological control kind of um, checks and balances that we use to make sure we're not releasing anything harmful. Um, and it's also thought that that chytrid fungus in particular wouldn't affect cochlea frogs because they don't have a tadpole stage. Um, and I believe the chytrid fungus mainly affects or largely affects the um, tadpole stage of other frogs, but cochlea frogs don't have a tadpole stage, which is another reason why they can reproduce so quickly and be such a threat. Great, thank you, Susan. And I just threw in um, a YouTube video in the chat on a really great video that explains biocontrol um, a little more in depth, but kind of gets that conversation started and what that process is like. So you can check that out in the chat. Um, Thanks, Serena. If you have any questions, yeah. And I, I should mention that I haven't heard about those beetles, but I will be sure to look it up and see what I can learn. Sounds interesting. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Bill. All right, I don't see any further questions in Facebook, but if you are joining us on Facebook Live, throw in a comment or question in the comment section and Susan can answer that live for you right now. Um, otherwise, you can go back later down the road and put in questions in the chat and we can follow up with that at a later time. Um, but I want to just give a couple more minutes if anybody has any last questions or comments for Susan, um, you can throw it here in the Zoom or throw it in our Facebook Live. And I just put, yeah. yeah. I just put my contact information back up too so people can reach out to me uh, privately if they want to, it's totally fine. Yep. All right, well, I don't see any further questions. So it looks like you covered everything. Oh, spoke too soon. Amanti, do other islands have community cookie control programs or just MISC? Maui, just Maui. Um, so we're the only ones with a koki focused program. Uh, this, um, our program was really kind of designed, inspired by the LFA program that the Big Island Invasive Species Committee folks have over there where they're working with residents to apply the little fire ant treatments. So um, we're the only ones doing koki right now. I do believe in the past, Big Island has had something similar that they're not able to focus on, on koki any currently. Mahalo, mahalo Monty. All right, from Niles on Molokai, great presentation. I love the Koki neighborhood effort. Everyone helping out is always a good thing. I agree with that, Niles. Yep, mahalo. Absolutely. All right, well, with that, we are going to conclude this presentation. Just want to mahalo Susan again for um, sharing about the work that the Koki crew is doing and the community effort that's happening. And mahalo you folks as well for joining us. Um, if you want to stay tuned for our next um, Hi Sam presentation that's coming up, we have pretty much a presentation every day um, for the next couple of weeks at least. And I'm bringing it up right now. It keeps going back to last year's one, but I'm going to throw that in the chat as well. If you want to join in on us um, on our high sound presentations, uh, we are continuing tomorrow with a landscape perspective on fire and invasive species um, in Hawaii. That presentation is going to be by Clay Traurnick, who's a wildland fire specialist with the UH uh, Cooperative Extension Unit. Um, that's going to be tomorrow, February 8th, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m. So come in on in and join us. We're also going to have several other Maui Nui focus presentations and this um, presentations this week and next week as well. So take a look at the link in the chat and come and join us for Hi Sam. 
All right, mahalo everybody. Mahalo. All right.